Um, do we go over the ones that we skipped, or we just we just move on? So, what, what's your take on this, Andrew? Well, you know, this would be a good thing to touch in on. Um, I would think that we may do a little bit of looping back, especially with these early cantos, because the way they were written was not necessarily in order and they were revised early on. Um, but also, I'm quite aware that we've got, you know, a book of 100, almost 120 cantos and eight weeks. And um, there will be parts of them we can move faster through and slower through, but I would for the moment probably hold off on the ones we haven't looked at. I thought we might get back to one of them today uh, briefly to look at a few things. Okay, so before we get going, just a reminder that if you're not speaking to mute yourself, sometimes we forget we're unmuted and the dog starts barking or the spouse comes in and um, it affects the quality of the recording. So please do that and then be sure to unmute yourself when you have a question to ask. I think the raising of the cyber hand method is has been successful. So I would encourage you to go to reactions there at the bottom of the screen. And then isn't that, isn't that where it goes? Reactions and then hand gesture or raise hand or something like that? Yeah, at the reactions, there's then a raise hand at the bottom of it. Yeah. There we have it. Okay, so that's that'll be our plan. We're missing a couple of people. But uh, Andrew, we're all set. 305, take it away. Can I just quickly ask you a question? You mentioned that they weren't written in order. And I immediately thought, wow, that would be fine today, you know, with, with Word and cutting and pasting and deleting and stuff like that. But did he? how did he actually write this stuff? Did he write it with like an old manual typewriter? Or did he write it by hand, you know? Uh, mostly with old manual typewriters. Yeah, they were really hard to change stuff, you know? Yeah, yeah. And um, with the early, well, with a number of the cantos, um, he would eventually hand them off to his daughter, who would meticulously type them. So there were times where he was writing by hand, and she would then prepare a manuscript. But that's, that's for later in the book. That's when he's incarcerated and doesn't have a typewriter available for a while. Um, Thank you. Yeah. And it's only really the early cantos because he had not necessarily false starts, but he began to write cantos, very unclear what he was doing. And at some point, took them back into the workshop, renumbered them, reordered material, discarded some material. And at some point, for instance, Canto One was originally um Later on in the sequence, it may only have been Canto Three, but you know he moved it up to the front, deciding that that was the place he wanted to begin. Cool. Um, but let's see. I wanted to um, go back to a couple of things. Actually, I don't see the person I th think who asked the question last week about where to go if you want to find out more about the troubadours. And the troubadours will be important because they wind throughout the cantos. It's not just that one canto that we looked at. And I'd completely forgotten that there were two young poets who went and visited Ezra Pound in Washington, D.C. Um, in the mid 1950s when he was um, uh, incarcerated at St. Elizabeth's Hospital for the criminally insane. We'll get to the tales behind that, but um, two poets came, young poets, looking for some counsel or advice or guidance. And one of them was Paul Blackburn and Ezra Pound recommended um, uh, teach yourself Provençal and go to Europe and visit the sites and translate the troubadours, that these are the missing link. Ezra Pound believed they were the missing link, not only in our uh, traditions of poetry, but in, um, in a kind of ongoing tradition of mysticism that went all the way back to the Eleusinian mysteries and were Ezra Pound's, it was his hope that these would really either replace or somehow overshadow Christianity, which he had not a lot of um, sympathy for. And that the troubadours, he believed their poetry 
was uh, the missing link in that it was mostly love poetry that uh, was built around a mysticism, an erotic mysticism. And um, so Paul Blackburn came, got the advice, but so did another poet who I had forgotten about, who was um, W.S. Merwin as a young man, went to St. Elizabeth and Pound also said to him, uh, the crucial thing to be studying is the troubadours. And so Merwin went off and to France also, and not only taught himself Provençal and began to translate, but he ended up having a long, long relationship with several of the towns in Southern France. He bought himself an old farmhouse in Southern France. And he wrote, you know, if you like Merwin's prose, it's quite impressionistic and, you know, doesn't necessarily like follow a straight narrative. But if you like Merwin's prose, this book, The Maze of Ventadorn, is the account of him visiting Ezra Pound, getting some counsel to learn old Provençal, and then his long encounter with the troubadours, um, with a lot of translations inside of this book. Maze is an old term for hawthorns, which show up um, as a kind of symbolic plant in the troubadour poetry. And Ventadorn is the name both of a town or village or hamlet where Merwin bought a house, but also one of the best known and early troubadours, Bernard de Ventadorn. And so winding through this book is all of Merwin's attempts to excavate um, troubadour traditions in general, but very specifically the troubadour Bernard de Venterdorn. And, um, you know, this was a uh, kind of a lovely era that lasted a scant hundred years, less than two centuries, a little over a hundred years. And then um, with uh, shifting politics, shifting military alliances, and shifting temperaments was pretty much wiped out in southern France, the whole troubadour tradition and the religions that it was based on. And it's believed that a number of the troubadours managed to escape the military incursions and got off to Sicily, where they may have been among the founders of the sonnet tradition, which eventually came into Italy and became, you know, sort of the groundwork of Cavalcanti and Dante, Dante Alighieri. So um, the troubadours uh, are, you know, again, I think for my, to my mind, um, it's Ezra Pound's own writing on the troubadours and then the work that Blackburn and Merwin did. You can find a lot of academic books on the troubadours and the women who are called Trobi Ritz. Um, but I think the, the poets' books are really, in a way, the best. Um, and then that also made me remember that, you know, this was a very fertile moment in American poetry, that mid-1950s, and so much of the great um, scattering of seeds came from, uh, from Ezra Pound through visitors who came to see him. I wanted to um, give a quick read from a passage in the Merwin book um, where he describes his visit with Ezra Pound. If you're going to be a poet, he said, you have to work at it every day. You should write about 75 lines a day, but at your age, you don't have anything to write about. You may think you do, but you don't. So get to work translating. The Provençal is the real source. The poets, poets are closest to music. They hear it, they write to it. Try to learn the Provençal, at least some of it, if you can. Meanwhile, the others, Spanish is all right. The Roman Cero is what you want there. Get as close to the original as you can. It will make you use your English and find out what you can do with it. And then uh, a couple of weeks after Merwin had left, he received a postcard from Ezra Pound that said, read seeds not twigs, EP, read seeds, not twigs. Um, so that was Merwin and Blackburn. Uh, may as well mention some of the other poets who visited there. Allen Ginsberg visited there, um, you know, visited Ezra Pound before he wrote Howell. 
Um, uh, let's see, Robert Duncan tried to go visit Pound, started hitchhiking across the country from California, but got sick along the way and had to turn back. Gary Snyder somewhere in one of his journal writes, he's wondering if he should go visit Pound at St. Elizabeth's. It was sort of the, the pilgrimage spot if you wanted to be a poet in the 1950s. Um, Robert Lowell visited and took Elizabeth Bishop with him. Uh, another poet named Mary Barnard visited and Ezra Pound said, try to learn Greek. Somebody needs to do a good translation of Sappho and Mary Barnard translated Sappho and that's been in print ever since. I mean, it's been in print, you know, it's still in print from University of California Press. New edition just came out. Um, Guy Davenport visited. Charles Olson visited and wrote a book about his visits with Ezra Pound. And a young Diane de Prima visited and spent two weeks in Washington, D.C., um, visiting every day with Ezra Pound. And, you know, if any of you have ever wondered out of Diane de Prima's whole range of writings, one of the oddest things is a little chapbook she did called something like Seven Translations from the Latin. And though she, of course, has Italian anarchist roots. Why would she study Latin? That seems like the old language of empire, but I think it came through the urgings of Ezra Pound. So, you know, a little bit of um, fertility happening at that point. Um, there's still some wonderful, uh, you know, cross fertilizations that have been coming on. I don't know if any of you up there in Cascadia know this little title by Red Pine, Cafe Revisited. Um, Red Pine was going to go do a pilgrimage in northern Italy to visit Ezra Pound's daughter, and he tried to think of what he could bring her for a gift. And he decided what he could do was he would take the 15 poems of Pound's original book of translations, Cafe, and retranslate them with little commentaries. So this is Cafe Revisited. And it, do any of you know this book? Do any of you have it? One of the things I really love about it is um, the frontispiece by a Port Townsend artist um, named Linda Okazaki. You can see this. This is Ezra Pound walking with his cane through the snowy streets of Port Townsend, past a bookshop window, and copies of the cantos are on display in Port Townsend. It is, of course, whimsical, or even science fiction, or maybe just aspirational. Ezra Pound never visited Port Townsend, but it shows a little bit of the, uh, you know, interesting uh, sort of fertility coming out of, you know, the interest in Pound and the sense of Pound himself being a point of pilgrimage, particularly in those 1950s and into the early 1960s. Um, there's a well-documented later visit by uh, Allen Ginsberg, Gregory Corso, and Peter Orlovsky to Ezra Pound in Italy, and we may talk about that a bit down the road. But um, Pilgrimage was really part of Ezra Pound's life and work. And I think I mentioned that in around 1912, he had done a walking trip through Southern France. And that was where he not only delved really deeply into the troubadours, but he visited all the sites associated with the troubadours that he could find. And so a lot of the landscapes of the cantos come out of his memory of this walking tour and the various um, oh, palaces, fortresses, hamlets, um, cathedrals that he saw in South France when he was on this trip. Where we're about to go with the cantos now, cantos eight through 11 came out of another pilgrimage Pound did in 1922. Um, he went to uh, northern Italy and spent three months wandering around and 
got up to a town called Rumini, which is near the Adriatic seashore, and found maybe the most important um, architectural uh, uh, structure for his own thinking and his own life. Uh, let me just stop a moment. Somebody had their hand up. Was that you, Roxy? Yeah, I didn't want to interrupt your incredible lecture, yeah. though. Um, I do have a question about pilgrimages later um, and my studies of troubadours, but I, it can wait. Okay, okay, good. So 1922, wandering around North Italy, Ezra Pound ends up in Rimini, which um, a old medieval town near the shores of the Adriatic, and he discovers an extraordinary building there that had been built and never, or had been in the process of being built and was never finished by a 15th century warlord named Sigismundo Malatesta. Um, you can look up Malatesta, get details from his life. You probably don't need more details than show up in these four cantos, eight through 11. And I want to say that probably for the first 20 years I read the cantos, those Malatesta cantos were like the wasteland to me. They were inexpressibly arid. I had no idea why anybody would be interested or why one should read them or what the point was. And there are other points of the cantos where you will feel similarly and maybe even longer stretches of the cantos where you'll feel like you're just dragging yourself through an, you know, a wasteland, you know, that is both um, arid and boring. And um, what I want to try to do is point out, if not, if not spur your interest in these cantos, which are called the Malatesta cantos, at least um, open them up and give you a feeling for why they are there and why they actually form an important part of the cantos. Um, there's also, you know, an interesting um, feeling that Ezra Pound had. I said that he revised a bit at the beginning, stripped apart his early cantos, rebuilt them, reordered them. He did the same with some of these Malatesta cantos. But very quickly, the architectural model um, settled in with him, and he began to tell people that it may seem really tough to you now, now it may seem incomprehensible. You may not have any idea what I'm doing, but believe me, when I get to Canto 100, that's going to be the capstone. And when I put that on top, the whole thing will become crystal clear. Um, he, of course, chose the number 100 because that's how many cantos there are in the Divine Comedy of Dante. But it's clear from early on he was looking that direction. Um, so... The Malatesta Cantos, we've now gone up through Canto 7. We've had Homer and the Trojan War. We've had Odysseus visiting the underworld. We've had great transformations of the god Dionysus. Uh, we had a little moment in Canto 3 where we got a quick glimpse of the Spanish epic hero, Mio Cid, or the Cid, or El Cid. The um, this was a medieval Spanish epic that Pound uh, had read and appreciated, and we can come back to that a little bit. But the Cid is a quasi mythological, or let's say at least legendary character in Spain, quasi historical, but quasi historical in the way that Troy is quasi historical. Most of the accounts we have are embellished with legend or embedded in, you know, sort of mythological or legendary takes. Um, we had then uh, a couple of cantos I passed over, which were deeply into poetic traditions, particularly troubadour traditions, Sappho, Catullus, a great deal of Pound's learning, but they were more about the poetry than about the people. When Pound walked into Rimini and found the Tempio, El Tempio, or the temple that Malatesta had spent his adult life building, um, Pound realized he really needed also historical figures in his book. And he decided 
to start doing some research into this figure of Sigismundo Malatesta. Malatesta was, as I said, a warlord. He could be ruthless. He could be brutal. He could change his alliances. He was effectively a mercenary at times who did a lot of his fighting for money. He controlled a certain territory and got a reputation when at the age of 13, a much, much larger superior army marched on his family holdings. And at 13 years old, he took charge of the family army and decimated the, the invading army. And he developed this huge reputation and his um, presence as a mercenary warlord uh, was in demand a great deal, but there were also shifting alliances all over Italy. And he very quickly ran afoul of the Catholic church. And curiously, um, until Ezra Pound came along, almost nobody knew anything about Sigismundo Malatesta except from the rather vicious writings of Pope Pius II, who loathed him and excommunicated him and accused him of all sorts of heinous crimes. And so um, Malatesta had been sort of doubly buried, first as a human being and then as a spiritual being by the Catholic Church, maybe triply, because then by the historians who just read, you know, the excommunication letters and correspondence, Pope Pius really seemed to have um, a hair up his butt about Sigismundo. It's hard to say why, but, you know, it. Uh, and this is some of the material that is in the cantos. But for Pound, you know, equally important or more important than Sigismundo as a person was Sigismundo as a patron of the arts and in some ways an artist. Sigismundo wrote poetry, um, fought wars, uh, conquered territory, and built this extraordinarily complex um, tempio, the Tempio Malatesta, which rather than um, removing the old Gothic church to St. Francis that had been on the grounds there, they decided to incorporate the Gothic church. And on top of the Gothic church, or with, you know, around the Gothic church, built a Renaissance structure. And Malatesta then searched far and wide for marble fittings and classical pillars and various things. And what the temple really is, is like a great collage of architecture with at least Byzantium, um, Gothic styles, Renaissance styles, um, you know, old ruined um, pillars and cornices. And um, he even had elephants carved to hold up his pillars. Nobody in Italy of that day had ever seen an elephant, but they knew them from, you know, Eastern models. So in some ways, it's like this extraordinarily ambitious, large um, structure built out of fragments and imagery and different layers of time. And for Pound, he saw this, um, there's a great quote from him. He says that the Tempio was a monumental failure, yet it is the apex, apex of what's been achieved in the last 1000 years. And to Pound, it was more interesting to have an ambitious failure than a really safe little structure that conformed to all the models of what people expected. And I think he began to see this as the model for his cantos, that you reached far and wide, you plundered where you needed to, you brought stuff in, you brought in the, you brought in the best craftspeople. And Malatesta really had hired the finest architects and artists of his day to build his tempio. And that's one of the roles I think the translation plays in the cantos, as Pound is going out and finding the finest writers in his estimation and importing their work right into the cantos, just as Malatesta had brought in artists to carve friezes. Um, I should also say that the tempio was a monument 
to Sigismundo's love for to his lover Isolta, uh, who became his third wife. And the idea was that this was a monument to their love and would include their tombs, um, but not just their tombs. He had 14 sarcophagi built, and it was going to be him and Isolta, and the other ashes were going to be great learned scholars of the past. And though he in his lifetime only managed to fill seven of them, he would go out looking for the remains of Neoplatonic philosophers. He wanted to reintroduce a kind of Neoplatonic take to Italy to break the hold of Catholicism, break the hold of the Catholic Church, or at least to uh, soften the paper and change everything with some real intelligence rather than what Sigismundo Malatesta saw as just, um, uh, what would you say, naked grabs for power by the papacy. And one of the reasons he, he was probably excommunicated, not so much because they didn't like his behavior as an ethical person, he was excommunicated because he often sided against the papacy when they tried to take lands from other people. He would muster up his armies um, and do, and he was a great street fighter. And so, of course, the um, Pope Pius II and his henchmen um, really didn't like a guy who was willing to take on the papacy and call a spade a spade. And so, Pound has sort of, you know, in these cantos excavated two things, a hero figure who um, had a great ambitious art project and employed all the artists of the day and the art project itself becoming something of a model for his own cantos. So that may not help you slog through the, you know, the swamps the swamps of these cantos, but it may. I'm gonna take just a second and turn on the light here. I can see I'm getting a little bit dark. Roxy has her hand up, Andrew. Good, Roxy, can I have your question? Sure, um, that was amazing. I, I, I think it will help me slog through, but it has given me a model to think about in terms of this collage, this architectural collage that started to form in my head a a sort of cultural collage that Nate Mackey writes about when talking about the Spanish influence on Lorca's notion of the duende from the Moors to the Jews to the Bedouin to the Spaniards. And I'm thinking about this kind of um, mashup focus that you just said, I'm glad I held off this comment, on um, this recombinant form that informed his, his cantos, Ezra Pound's cantos. Going back to the troubadours, I'm wondering if you feel like instead of the what I learned when I was trying to teach Sir Gawain in the Green Knight, which was written around the same time, was that there was this kind of tradition of loof talking, right? This eros um, and spiritual, this this combination of eros and spirituality. But I don't see any evidence. Again, I'm not a pound scholar or reader so much as like so many people here probably, but I don't see evidence of that kind of love poetry that I was sort of teaching in a continuum to Shakespeare's uh, sonnets as when he's turning sonnet for the favor of the queen, um, but also his his body of 150 sonnets to his um, young lover, this man. Um, it feels more in line with the loof talking that might be odes to friendship, male friendship in particular, a kind of eros of, of, the, of the kind that maybe Malatesta is you know, practicing, um, who are the great scholars? Because you see this homage of Pound to all the great scholars um, in his cantos, but not so much the kind of sapphic lyric tradition that was supposedly happening with the great articulate knights who could love talk to their to their ladies. Um, but I see him kind of aloof talking to his, his fellow um, intellects. And, and artists, I don't know. What do you think? Is, is there something there? Like, I'm just trying to f find the troubadour in his in his style. I hear the troubadour maybe history, but I don't see it in his style to boil it down to a simpler question. 
Well, it may take getting to the end of the sonnets. I mean, ah, the, cantos, the end of the cantos. Um, and it might also take, um, if anybody's interested, there are there is a volume of the posthumous cantos. And what they really are are the cantos that never made it into the cantos. And it's astounding how much of that is love poetry to his girlfriend, Olga. Um, and in fact, if um, the, the last cantos really turn into love poetry and also sort of a wisdom poetry. But I think you're right. I think, you know, you would not see that at this point in, um, you know, in the cantos particularly. But thanks. That's a great comment, Roxy. I appreciate that. And we'll we'll watch for it. Bearing my ignorance at the end of the cantos. Thank you. Yeah, and and if we do loop back to Cantos five and six, you'll see translations of both Sappho and Catullus in there, which is very direct love poetry, of course. Um, but let's begin with um, this Malatesta Canto, um, uh, page twenty-eight, really. Um, so Canto eight, and these are four of the Malatesta Cantos. And I'm going to read a little bit. I'm going to do this selectively. We won't go through it all, but I want to point out some very important things. Um, one last um, just detail to know, at some point, we're going to start hearing about a mailbag. Um, this was a famous, famous, it was a bag of mail that had five months worth of mail that was supposed to be delivered for Sigismundo Malatesta. And one of the battles he lost, it was captured. And um, the hope I think of his enemies was that this would prove all sorts of damning evidence against him. And it turned out to be letters to his daughters, um, uh, letters talking about the temple he was building, letters about the artists he was employing. Um, but Ezra Pound apparently excavated this from archives in Siena and did a lot of translating. But the but the the, the mailbag shows up as almost a kind of joke here, as um, you know, this great effort by the papacy and the various other en enemies of Malatesta to find incriminating material, and actually it was mostly like. I said, letters to his daughter, letter, you know, asking to borrow money, various things like that. So we're starting here with this almost direct quote from T.S. Eliot, these fragments you have shelved shored from the wasteland, these fragments I have shored against my ruins. Might be worth knowing that when this poem was first in an earlier version was first published in the Criterion where T.S. Eliot was the editor, he said, oh, you've got to drop this first line. Everybody already thinks that you and I write each other's poems for each other, and this will just confirm it for them. You've got to drop this first line. Um, but it is absolutely an echo of the wasteland. These fragments you have shelved, shored, Slut, bitch, truth, and calliope slanging each other sous les lauriers. So calliope, the muse of epic poetry, something about truth and calliope uh, not getting along very well. And I think that's may, may be like an overall comment on what had happened to Malatesta's reputation. Slanging each other sous les lauriers or beneath the laurels, the um, great image of poetry. That Alessandro was Negroid, and Malatesta, Sigismund, Frater Tomcom, et Compater Carissime, Dergo, Ani de Dicis, Entia, equivalent to Giovanni of the, Medici, of the Medici, Florence. Letter received. And in the matter of our Messier Giannozio, one from him also sent on in form and with all due dispatch, having added your wishes and memoranda. As to arranging peace between you and the King of Ragona, so far as I'm concerned, it would give me the greatest possible pleasure. At any rate, nothing would give me more pleasure or be more acceptable to me. And I should like to be party to it, as was promised me, 
either as participant or adherent. This is a straight out translation of a letter of Sigismundo's. As for my service money, perhaps you and your father would draw it and send it on to me as quickly as possible. And tell the maestro di pintore, that's the painting master. This um, is probably Piero della Francesca, who um, he was hiring, Malates was hiring. And tell the maestro di pintore that there can be no question of his painting the walls for the moment, as the mortar is not yet dry and it would be merely work chucked away, mutato via. That's the Italian sort of for chucked away, thrown into the streets. But I want it to be quite clear that until the chapels are ready, I will arrange for him to paint something else so that both he and I shall get as much enjoyment as possible from it. And in order that he may enter my service, and also because you write me that he needs cash, I want to assure him that he will get the sum agreed on. You may say that I will deposit security for him wherever he likes. And let me have a clear answer, for I mean to give him good treatment so that he may come to live the rest of his life in my lands, unless you put him off it. And for this, I mean to make due provision so that he can work as he likes or waste his time as he likes. Affatigandose per suo piacere o no, non glimancera la provizione mai. Never lacking provision. Sigismundo Pandolfus de Malatestas. Just stop there a moment, Paul, and just go back up a few lines. Um, this, I think, is what really grabbed Pound. You know, Pound's sense was that the only way to make art is to have what he called leisure time. But most of the artists he know he didn't think had leisure time because he defined leisure time as free time without the anxiety over money. Most of the artists he knew had free time, but were always anxious about money. And for him to find this letter of a warlord who's willing to hire a painter and um, basically stand him with a good salary for the rest of his life so that he can work as he likes, or waste his time as he likes. To Pound, this was incredibly important, and this is the only way to really get work done, you know, and get the best out of your artists. So I think we're beginning to see a maturing of Pound's sense of economy or something, and the sense of what the work is. Um, but that's the role that this letter really plays, and we're gonna have a big echo of it in a number of cantos where another letter by a completely different person is sounding exactly the same. But this is Malatestas making his offer for Piero della Francesca to come and be in his employ for the rest of his life with a good stipend so that he can work as he likes or waste his time as he likes. Uh, let's go for a moment to page 31. Um, and look at about halfway down the page. And the Greek emperor was in Florence, Ferrara having the past. And with him, Gemistus Plethon, talking of the war about the temple at Delphos. Gemistus Plethon was a medieval Neoplatonic Greek scholar. And this is one of the guys whose remains Sigismundo brought to the Tempio to put in his, uh, to in a sarcophagus there, like a sort of holy man of Neoplatonism. And this, of course, would have been um, horribly offensive to the papacy. The idea that you would pass off all, pass over all those good bishops and cardinals and whatever, and go to Greece looking for a Neoplatonist. And with him, Gemistus Plethon, talking of the war about the temple at Delphos, and of Poseidon, concrete Alumine, and telling of how Plato went to Dionysius of Syracuse, because he had observed the tyrants were most efficient in all that they set their hands to, but he was unable to persuade Dionysius to any amelioration. And in the gate at Ancona, between the foregate and the main gates, 
notice the change of tone right here or somewhere complete you know this is like byzantine marble on top of gothic architecture we just had this little glance at gemistus lethon in greece and now suddenly we're in a very different place and in the gate at ancona between the foregate and the main gates sigismundo ally comes through an enemy force to patch up some sort of treaty passes one gate and they shut it before they open the next gate and he says now you have caught me now you have me caught like a hen in a coop and the captain of the watch says yes mazir sigismundo but we want this town for ourselves just a little bit of moment um from sigismundo's biography you could say how he got out of that scrape caught like a hen in a coop we're not told because very quickly we start to get just a kind of um list of Sigismundo's battles on the next page so let's scroll to the next page with the church against him of course the Catholic Church does not like Sigismundo with the church against him with a Medici bank for itself any of you who know the name Medici know that these guys sort of invented the modern banking system and they're not interested in taking sides. All they want is money. So with a church against him, with a Medici bank for itself, with Wattle Sforza against him, Sforza Francesco Wattle knows, who married him, Sigismundo, his Francesco's daughter in September, who stole Pesaro in October, as Broglio says, bestialmente, who stood with the Venetians in November, with a Milanese in December, sold Milan in November, stole Milan in December, or something of that sort. Just get that tone of Pound's voice here, or something of that sort. I mean, you have to realize that he's being very impressionistic. You know, he's, he's copying his notes, he's translating, he's putting things in, but I love these moments in the cantos where he himself gets bored with the information he's putting in. Sold Milan in November, stole Milan in December, or something of that sort. Commanded the Milanese in the spring, the Venetians at midsummer, the Milanese in the autumn, and was Naples' ally in October. So you can see he's bouncing around um, whoever's paying him, whoever he feels is in the right. It's a complicated life he's got. He's no hero in the modern sense, but he's always got his eye on something. He, Sigismundo, templum edificavit in Romagna, teeming with cattle thieves, with the game lost in mid-channel and never quite lost till 50 and never quite lost till the end in Romagna, so the Galliaz sold Pesaro to get pay for his cattle. And now, since Roxy, you were asking about the troubadours, we're back into Southern France. And Poictiers, you know, Guillaume Poictiers, this is one of the early troubadours, had brought the song up out of Spain with the singers and veals. But here they wanted a setting by Mareccia, where the water comes down over the cobbles. And Maston had come to Verruccio, and the sword, Palo Il Bellos, caught in the Aris. And in Esti's house, Parasina paid for this tribe paid always, and the house called also Atreides. Hang on there for a second. What's the Atreides? What's the house of Atreus? Anybody know? Actually, I can't see hands, but. The house of Atreus is Agamemnon. Agamemnon, yeah, it's it's Agamemnon. This is you know part of the Trojan War. We're just getting a quick like echo. All this warfare that's going on is like karmic in the way that well, Aeschylus, Euripides, Sophocles all wrote about the murder of Agamemnon by his wife Clytemnestra, who was Helen of Troy's sister, and the deep karma family and tribe there. For this tribe paid always, and the house called also Atreides, and the wind is still for a little, and the dusk rolled to one side a little, and he was 12 at the time, Sigismundo, and no dues had been paid for three years, and his elder brother gone pious, 
And that year they fought in the streets. And that year he got out to Sassina and brought back the levees. And that year he crossed by night over Folia and dot, dot, dot. Another and to end things there. But I think you can see that in a quick sweep right there, we had Sigismundo fighting. Then suddenly, you know, a link to the troubadours bringing the song up out of Spain. And then the sense of this ongoing warfare that Europe was prone to. And the little aside that it maybe goes all the way back to the house of Atreus in ancient Greece. And after that comment about Atreus, and the wind is still for a little, which reminds me always of that second canto with the uh, no wind is the king's wind. The wind belongs to every cow and calf, but the wind is still for a little and the dusk rolled to one side a little. And he was 12 at the time, Sigismundo. So Sigismundo is 12 years old. He fights off the enemy armies and he goes out and he gets the levies, which is to say the money that's owed to his family. So this guy's um, a tough street fighter, basically. Uh, Paul, let's scroll to the next canto um, and take a look. Just so, you know, we're going to now have a list that um, oh, yeah, sure. I've got a question there, Matteo. Yeah, yeah, sorry, quick question. I just became Matteo because there's so many Matthews on here. But uh, oh, okay. um, but the uh, are those letters real? I mean, they'd be almost 500 years old. And where did he find them, these letters in the post bag? Uh, he thought he found them in an archive in Siena. Okay, okay. You know, I want to fill in one little detail. That's a good question. I was actually, you know, talking last night. Um, with Amy about it, but um, Ezra Pound's girlfriend, Olga Rudge, had discovered in archives works of a long neglected, completely forgotten composer named Antonio Vivaldi. And it was really Olga who resurrected Vivaldi. And so Pound was with her and spending a lot of time going around Italy into different archives. And he probably found these letters in Siena, but knew what they would be because he was already interested in the Tempio, mm. visited it, and was beginning to put together the idea that this could be a model for his cantos. Very cool. I'm surprised the Catholic Church let those letters exist. You know, it's, it's great that um, well, a lot of stuff didn't exist, and that is a problem. But, you know, there were also, um, if you think of it, half of these battles have the papacy on one side and other city-states um, opposed to the papacy. So there may be things that if the Pope wanted them destroyed, there may have been cities that said, we got to save these things. So, you know, it would have been battled not just for territory, but for reputation, for, you know, just basic animosity. Yeah, heritage. I, yeah, I get it. Thank you. That's great. Yeah, helpful. Sure. Good. So we're going to just now have a quick little list poem. This is the kind of list poem that the uh, New York School, you know, I mean, if you think of like Ted Berrigan or Ann Waldman or somebody, this is what they were doing. And they were, you know, seeing this other places too, but this is one place they really saw it. You know, the, I do this, I do that poem, walking around the city streets. This is a little bit different. It's Sigismundo. He was doing a lot of different things, but nine. One year floods rose, one year they fought in the snows. One year hail fell, breaking the trees and walls. Down here in the marsh, they trapped him in one year. And he stood in the water up to his neck to keep the hounds off him. Maybe a little echo to Acte on there, who didn't get away from the hounds, but he stood in the water up to his neck to keep the hounds off him. And he floundered about in the marsh and came in after three days. That was a story Manfredi of Faenza who worked the ambush and set the dogs off to find him in the marsh down here under Mantua. And he fought in Fano in a street fight, and that was nearly the end of him. And the emperor came down and knighted us. And they had a wooden castle set up for fiesta. And one year, Bassinio went out into the courtyard where the lists were and the palisades had been set for the tourneys. 
and he talked down the Auntie Helena, and there was an heir male to the Seigneur, and Madame Ginevra died. And he, Sigismundo, was Capitan for the Venetians. And he had sold off small castles and built the great Roca to his plan. Let me just stop there a moment. Sigismundo built two buildings. The Tempio was his heart place. The Roca was his fortress. So he was building a Roca too, as well as a Tempio. Roca is like a rock. It's a, you know, it's just a rock castle. And he fought like 10 devils at Montaluro and got nothing but the victory. And old Sforza bitched us at Pesaro, sick March the 16th, that Messier Alessandro Sforza has become Lord of Pesaro through the wangle of the illustrious Signor Messier Federico Dorbino, who worked the wangle with Galeas through the wiggling of Messer Francesco, who waggled it so that Galeas should sell Pesaro to Alex and Fossombrone to Fetti, and he had the right to sell. And this he did bestialmente, that is, Sforza did bestialmente, as he had promised him, Sigismunda, for Capitoli, to see that he, Malatesta, should have Pissarro. And this cut us off from our south and finished, from our south half and finished our game thus in the beginning. And he, Sigismundo, spoke his mind to Francesco and we drove them out of the marches. Uh, so, you know, you have to be a history buff to like this stuff, but you can feel the energy in that. Um, uh, let's just go a little further down the page. And the King of Ragona, Alphonse Leroy d'Aragon, was the next nail in our coffin. And all you can say is anyway, that he, Sigismundo, called a town council and Valturio said, as well for a sheep as a lamb, and this changeover, heck traditio, as old Bladder said, rem iorum saravit, saved the Florentine state, and that maybe was something. And Florence, our natural ally, as I said in the meeting, for whatever that was worth afterward. And he began building the Tempio, and Polyxena, his second wife, died. And the Venetians sent down an ambassador and said, speak humanely, but tell him it's no time for raising his pay. And the Venetians sent down an ambassador with three pages of secret instructions to the effect, did he think the campaign was a joyride? Notice the modern slang that Pound is throwing in here. Does he think the campaign's a joyride? An old waddle waddle slipped into Milan and he couldn't stand Sidge being so high with the Venetians and he talked it over with Fetty. Um, so let's come back to the screen for a moment. Here we are, you know, getting like along through the Malatesta cantos now, and I hope I'm making them come alive a little bit, or if not alive, at least seeing what the role of them is. Um, you know, it seems that uh, Pound really wanted an interesting historical figure. And then he, with his research, he just started writing these cantos. He wrote a letter to his mother at one point saying, I've got notes all over the place for a canto here on Malatesta. And not much later, he wrote her and said, actually, it's going to be two cantos. And then it ended up being four cantos. So he's really moving along as he feels like it. But, you know, there's a lot of material that he's trying to gather. But I think it's not just that he's gathering material and building, but this is where he's beginning to really feel okay, now I know what I'm doing. After having seen the Tempio and seeing the energy of this guy who was doing all sorts of things, but constantly had his eye on getting the best artists, the best architects, um, writing poetry, bringing in poets. And so all this other activity was to create, you know, it may not sound like a utopia ruled over by a warlord, who loved street fighting, but it is a kind of utopia of the arts, which is what, you know, Pound was sort of hoping to have. And um, so in a way that becomes a model for the cantos too. 
it's a utopia. It may not be everybody's utopia that he's working on. This may not be where you want to live. And it's full of history and it's full of boring things. But so is life full of history and boring things and warfare and, you know, uncertainty um, and trying to make it up as we go along. And so this is what, you know, this is sort of where these cantos are working along. Um, so uh, let me see. I think what we're going to Andrew, do. Andrew, can I ask a quick question? Are are these street fighting? Um, is Melatesta sort of like a an indentured knight, kind of like an adjunct faculty member? You know, like someone who doesn't have the the feudal knight standard of the tenure tract. You know, the the property owning knight, right? Are are they sent out on? Um, He's property like, owning. You know, tell him it's no time for raising his pay and. Yeah, there are well, moments he, he's a property yeah. owner, but property is very, very tentative in Italy at this time. There are many city states all battling and all trying to take over everything from trade to the Levant to controlling Mediterranean trade to um, holding territory. And the um, family structures were very complicated, too. Um, you know, Sigismundo uh, and his brothers were all considered illegitimate. They were their father's son, but they were considered illegitimate in the eyes of the church. So they were trying to hold on to what they considered their land, but there were plenty of people who didn't believe it was their land. So Sigismundo is kind of neither of what you're asking about. He's, you know, he wants... He should, or he should be, or he hopes to be, or his family has property, but he's not really clear that he belong, you know, that he's accepted. And legally, his claim is not very easy. His older brother, who went pious, escaped the whole thing by going into a monastery, just said, I don't want to deal with this. But Sigismundo turned out to be such a good fighter that um, he decided he was going to try to keep the family lands intact and clear things up. Um, so it's a very complicated shifting alliances, shifting city states, and a little bit of money shifted everybody's alliances. The papacy wasn't like one thing. The papacy was quite happy to shift their alliances if somebody paid them a little bit more money. They were just one more fighting force with maybe a little bit more money and this veneer of piety or Catholicism over the top. But the papacy, the Vatican, was one more city-state fighting for power throughout Italy. Well, yeah, let's see. I think we should maybe move to, um, let's go to... Uh, why don't we go to page 44, Paul, if you'd bring this up. Um, about a third of the way down, there's a long broken line. There, right there, yeah, right. Just a little higher up, a little higher up. Um, yeah, good. Uh, I just want to show you, you know, we've just had a long line or a long letter in um, Latin. And now we've got this interesting typographical thing. Somebody asked about what he was writing on. This is just the typewriter making a bunch of dots across the page. And we're going to pick up mid, mid adventure here. So that in the end, that pot scraping little runt, Andreas Benzi da Siena, got up to spout out the bunkum that that monstrous, swollen, swelling SOB, Papa Pio Secunda, that's Pope Pius II, Aeneas Silvius Picciolomini da Siena, had told him to spout in their best bears grease Latinity. I hope all of you managed to get to some of this because this is where Pound gets really good. Um, it's sort of remarkable, the, um, the um, vulgarity of Pope Pius's language when he comes to dealing with um, with uh, Sigismundo and Pound's giving it back right here. Uh, I like this idea of the best bears grease Latinity. And now this is quoting from Pope Pius's encomium. 
and you don't have to know what all these words mean to get a feel for it. Stupro, sedi, adulter, homicidia, parasidia ac perioris, presbyteracidia, audax libidinosus. I love that this guy is being accused of being like a parasite in a Presbyterian side. Wives, Jew girls, nuns, necrophilias, fornicarium, oxycarium, Prodator, raptor, incestuosus, incendiarius, ac concubinicarius. And on top of all those things, and that he rejected the whole symbol of the apostles. In fact, he did on top of his tempio. He didn't have any of the symbols of the apostles. He had elephants and alligators. And that he rejected the whole symbol of the apostles. And that he said monks ought to not to own property and that he disbelieved in the temporal power, neither Christian, Jew, Gentile, nor any sect pagan, Nisi Forsitan Epicurei, and that he did, among other things, empty the fonts of the Chiexa, the Chiexa is the church, and that he did, among other things, empty the fonts of the Chiexa of holy water and fill up the same full with ink, that he might in God's dishonor stand before the doors of the said Chiexa, making mock of the inky faithful, they issuing thence by the doors in the pale light of the sunrise, which might be considered youthful levity, but was really a profound indication. I hope you find that as funny as I do. That after having accused him of being a parasite and incestuous and, you know, all sorts of terrible things. And the fact that as a boy, he filled up the holy water, the holy, the font of holy water with ink so that he could laugh at the faithful coming out with their faces all covered with ink. And then more translation. Whence that his Sigismundos fetter filled the earth and stank up through the air and stars to heaven, where, save they were immune from sufferings, it had made the imparadised spirits puke from their jeweled terraces. And then we come right back to lusorioso, incestuoso, perfide, et cetera, et cetera, infidele, sodomitico. <laughs> Uh, he's a fattori de monete false. That means he makes false money. Um, and so that's, um, you know, I think some of this Pound is having a lot of fun with in some ways here. Um, and uh, let's see. I think, you know, that's enough for these cantos right now. Um, you know, I invite you to Go back and reread them or leave them off. There's a lot of stuff in Latin, a lot of stuff in Italian, a um, lot of names. And, you know, if you want, you can track down all the history, but there's no need to particularly. But, um, you know, this will give you a little idea of the energy pound is finding there and particularly that underneath it all, like a bass drum or a bass note is the tempio that this guy is building, which becomes Pound's model for the cantos. Uh, Paul, I think your hand was up first. Hey, Andrew, um, I'm hearing all the very direct language, and I'm thinking about the the time in the 20th century when sort of the avant-garde poets uh, were really looking for something for inspiration, and then Pound really was it. It was Pound and D.H. Lawrence pretty much until the objectivists came around. Um, correct me if I'm wrong about that. So hearing all this direct language in that earlier part passage that you read, uh, it seems to me I could I could see how they would light up by hearing that uh, very direct speech at very slang, and then the slang in there using the word bunk or bunkum. I forget exactly what it was. Bunkum, but some, yeah. Yeah, that to me, uh, you know, I'm thinking about that time as well. 1912, Carl Sandburg is publishing Chicago poems and has a poem. I don't know if it was that time or around it. And, and certainly Buncombe was, a, was a, you know, slang that was in, in great use at the time. But Sandburg's poem, To a Contemporary Bunk Shooter, is a poem about the Reverend Billy Sunday, I believe it was. So I'm wondering... You know, if Pound is in Europe, he's staying in touch with American slang, or is that slang 
universal? So these, this is a two-part question I'm interested in hearing about. Yeah, um, you know, Pound uses a lot of, he, he, liked, he liked to remember that he was born in Haley, Idaho. And he liked to think of himself at times like he could be a cracker. You know, the, the term cracker comes from people who stood around in the country store around the cracker barrel and just shot the shit all day and ate crackers, basically. And he liked to think that he was that. He really wasn't. He lived in Europe. You know, Europe was very, very different. He lived in London, then he lived in Paris, then he lived in Italy. Um, so there were times where, um, you know, even the slang may be a little bit out of date. He would search, he had a lot of American friends, so he would hear this kind of thing. But but I think the, the bigger question is the permission to use that kind of language. You know, if you think of like a previous generation, Alfred Lord Tennyson was not using slang like that. Algernon Charles Swinburne was not using slang like that. Um, you know, the Brownings were not using slang like that. This is an entirely different view of language. And that's why the modernists, I mean, the you know, the, the later poets just picked up, you know, this is what Pound was doing. It was what William Carlos Williams was doing. Um, but the other thing I want to point out is the quotation of documents. You know, there's a whole movement called document, document, documentary poetics. And you could say Susan Howe may be one of our best known practitioners of that. But the idea that you can go into the library, pull out documents, piece them together, and those become part of your poem. You know, Williams picked it up right away. You know, Williams included all sorts of letters in Patterson, which he was, you know, writing as a kind of repost to Pound's cantos, but, you know, Pound was the one who, you know, so a number of things here, the use of documents, the use of slang words, the excavating of sort of unknown periods of history or figures in history, um, and allowing them to speak again. Um, but without, you know, and there's a judgment in there when, you know, Pound says, wattle wattle sferzo or you know speaking the wattle he's putting in his own judgments but really what he's effectively hoping to do is by pairing these kinds of documents to show that what Sigismundo really wants more than anything else is to support the artists of his day to do the art they need to do and then the incredible um accusations that the church makes against him so the idea is Let's look at both of these and see who this guy is and see what, you know, is really going on here. And then go look at the Tempio and decide, you know, what's important in history. This guy's reputation through the documents of the church that has excommunicated him or his aspirations to build a monumental failure, but more um, interesting than the successes of the day. Hmm. Uh, let's see. I see Anne over there. You've got your hand up. Yeah, uh, I, I just want to make I have a question about the documentation, but I, I do want to remind people that Shakespeare used a lot of crude slang. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But um, yeah, I was interested in the documentation in terms of how he presents it. Um, and I, I know you've read this all very carefully, so you might. I was hoping you'd be able to explain to me. Like sometimes when he's quoting Latin, he's he's in all caps, and sometimes he uses italics, and then there's a, this liberal use of quotation marks. In some sections, they're like in every right hand margin. I mean, left hand margin. So, have you figured out what he's doing in that respect? Uh, you know, that's a really good question. I have not gone to think about that. I mean, one of the things is, is papal documents may well have been written not only in Latin, but in all capital letters. You know, if you think of like how Latin, you know, was, you know, engraved, for instance, and important Latinate documents may have been capital letters. So that may simply explain that. The quote marks Pound uses 
variously. It can be documents he's translating. It can be quotes of people that he remembers. I think he sort of even makes them up a little bit. And I'm put in mind of the poet Charles Bernstein. I saw him give a reading once where he did a lot of, you know, with his fingers like quote marks. And somebody after the reading asked him, um, Who, wh where are those, those quotes from? And he said, Oh, I just put them in there. I make up the quotes. I, you know, I don't have the time to go look up quotes to put in there. So I just put in quote marks. Um, I, I'm not positive that Ezra Pound had that vision of typography that, you know, I mean, he's writing poetry. He's not writing like scholarship that he's expecting to go. He's not making, he's not making rules that he then, then follows about what, what, for example, it means if there's a quotation mark in every left line margin. There might be. I don't know. I don't know. Okay. But I don't know either. That's a, that's a really good question. Did. Yeah. Matthew, Matt. Well, I mean, uh, there's also the sense of the palimpsest that both Pound and HD were obsessed with. With, I mean, if you think of the sapphic fragments and the paper written on top of with other material and so you know, not having hard fixed rules about typography lends to that kind of disjointedness of the of the text where you're a little disoriented with regard to time, where like in the previous canto that we were reading, you get the movement from uh, the uh, Sigamundo to the Troubadours to uh, Agamemnon, and it so you're getting this kind of cyclical idea of time where things like layer on top of each other. Oh, that's and a nice insight. Like rules change over yeah, time. Yeah, yeah. You know, not to go too far off on it, but I would say that HD had a more mystical sense of palimpsest. And of course, was also eventually, you know, went through psychoanalysis with Freud and had that whole Freudian view of the palimpsest of the mind which I think Ezra Pound would have thought was a lot of nonsense, but I think Pound's palimpsests are historical so that he can look at the fighting in Italy and say, it's just like the house of Atreides, you know, in ancient Greece, you know, that layer upon layer. And we'll, we'll get to that eventually where he starts to layer historical times on top of each other. And that's very much more his sense of, of the, um, you know, the, uh, palimpsestic quality of history. Andrew, was he also um, influenced by Marinetti since futurism was happening at this time and um, F.T. Marinetti used a lot of caps, you know, to vocalize his, you know, audacious theatrical, you know, I don't know, deconstruction of bourgeois theater, but he was also, of course, um, handily enough a supporter of Mussolini. But do you think he was reading those those folks? Oh, he knew, he knew, he knew Marinetti. Um, we're going to have Marinetti's ghost show up in about 20 years. But, you know, he did know Marinetti, so he would certainly have been conversant with that material. Yeah, certainly. Yeah. And Matthew, again. Oh, I was just going to, and also in terms of typography, like in Blast, you know, with Wyndham Lewis, he's all over the place playing around with typography. Yeah. So he's that's the modern side. And Bunkum, he probably, you know, that was... H.L. Mencken, I think, is most known, also very known for that term. Yeah. <laughs> you probably read some some of his journalism, maybe. Yeah, certainly, and would have certainly heard it all through his upbringing. You know, it was just been stuff out it, there on the street. Yeah, it just it just means bullshit. Dude. Yeah, exactly. Uh, Amy, yeah. Was Pound reading Dogen at this point, with the notion that time? in our present moment is all times past, all times future right now? Uh, I don't think there was any Dogen translation. He wouldn't have known Dogen, I don't think. And okay. and he, um, uh, in interesting ways, was quite interested in Buddhism. Most of the time he disliked Buddhism. Um, but when his personal life broke down and he started to have visions, Guan Yin was sort of his goddess who kept showing up to save him. So goddess he had of a, compassion. Yeah, 
exactly. So sort of interesting. But yeah, I don't think he would have known Dogen, which would be too bad. It might have helped him a little bit. But I think he was more, you know, um, you know, almost you could say archaeologically minded, but archaeology in like terms of like just kind of the view back through history. Um, but you will have noticed but that aside from the occasional comment he makes, we don't have anything contemporary yet in the uh, cantos. You know, we're up through canto, if, you know, through the Malatesta cantos, through canto 11, and pretty much it's layers of history back there and um, poetries, but historically. So um, I want to go through Canto 12, which can just be a quick read. A lot of it is quite transparent, but worth reading. And if you um, possibly remember all the way back to Canto 3, the opening line was, I sat on the Dogana steps. And here on page 53, where Canto 12 opens, this is a very important canto, I think. And it opens with a very real echo of Canto 2. And we sit here under the wall, Arena Romana, Diocletian's Les Gradins, Carantois Ranger en Calcaire. Baldy Bacon bought all the little copper pennies in Cuba, un centavo, dos centavos, told his peons to bring them in. Bring them to the main shack, said Baldy. And the peons brought them in. So the main shack brought them, as Henry would have said. Nicholas Costano and Abana, he also had a few centavos, but the others had to pay a percentage, percentage when they wanted centavos, public centavos. Baldi's interest was in money business. No interest in any other kind of business, said Baldi, sleeping with two buck niggers chained to him, Guardia Regia chained to his waist to keep him from slipping off in the night, being by now unpopular with the Cubans. By fever reduced to pounds 108. Returned to Manhattan, ultimately to Manhattan, 24 East 47th, where I met him, doing job printing, i.e. agent, going to his old acquaintances, his office in Nassau Street, distributing jobs to the printers, commercial stationery, and later insurance, employer's liability, odd sorts of insurance, fire on brothels, et cetera, commission, rising from $15 a week, polon d'anthropon idan, knew which shipping companies were most careless. By the way, that Greek in there um, comes from the Odyssey, and it has to do with Odysseus. It translates as, of many men he saw, but the part that's not there in the Odyssey comes who of many men he saw and knew their minds. So this is one of um, Odysseus's sort of gifts is to sort of scope out who people are. This is just dropped in as a little description of this guy, Baldy Bacon. Polon Anthropon Eden knew which shipping companies were most careless, where a man was most likely to lose a leg in bad hoisting machinery, also fire, as when passing a whorehouse arrived miraculous Hermes by accident, two minutes after the proprietor's angelos had been, had been sent for him, saved his people 11,000 in four months on that Cuba job, but they busted, also ran up to 40,000 bones on his own once, but wanted to eat up whole of Wall Street and dropped it all three weeks later. Habitut, Cum quade, damn good fellow, Mons quade, who wore a monocle on a white sable ri ribbon elsewhere recorded. Dos Santos, Jose Maria Dos Santos, or suddenly skipping somewhere now. Notice we're just moving. Jose Maria Dos Santos, hearing that a grain ship was wrecked in the estuary of the Tagus, bought it at auction. Nemo obstabat meaning nobody stopped him, nobody obstructed him. No one else bidding. Damn fool. Maze spoiled with salt water. No use, can't do anything with it. Dos Santos. All the stuff rotted with seawater. Dos Santos, Portuguese lunatic, bought it. Mortgaged then all his patrimony, a tolo seal aver, and bought suckling pigs. 
pigs, small pigs, porkers throughout all Portugal, fed on the cargo, first lot mortgage to buy the second lot, and so weiter. Porkers of Portugal, fattening with the fullness of time. And Dos Santos fattened, a great landlord of Portugal, now gathered to his fathers, did it on water-soaked corn, water probably fresh in that estuary. Go to hell, Apovich, Chicago ain't the whole pumpkin. Just stop for a moment there. That story about Dos Santos um, is going to now be contrasted with this great intervening line that is, again, this cracker voice of Ezra Pound. Go to hell, Apovich, Chicago ain't the whole pumpkin. And now we're going to have a guy named Jim X. And we know from research that Jim X was a guy named Jim Quinn or James Quinn, who was a wealthy, um, wealthy man, uh, worked, um, well, one of the things we know best about him is that he supported James Joyce's, I'm sorry, William Butler Yeats's father, who was a painter, and also fed a lot of money to Yeats and Yeats's brother, who was a painter, and kind of supported James Joyce by buying James Joyce's manuscripts. So for Ezra Pound, Jim X is going to be something of a hero here, you know, or just in his life as somebody he knows who is willing to take money and try to stake important artists, you know, to, to a living. Jim X in a banker's meeting bored with their hard luck stories, bored with their bloom and primness, and the little white rims they wore around inside the edge of their vests to make them look as if they had on two waistcoats, told them the tale of the honest sailor. Bored with their proprieties, as they sat, the ranked Presbyterians, directors, dealers through holding companies, deacons and churches owning slum properties, alias usurers in excelsis. If you're marking your book at all, you might want to underline the usurers there because usury is going to be the great hell motivation in the cantos eventually. But alias usurers in excelsis, or, you know, the ones who excel at usury, the quintessential essence of usurers, the purveyors of unemployment whining over their 20%, and the hard times and the bust up of Brazilian securities, South American securities, and the gen general uncertainty of all investment, save investment in new bank buildings, productive of bank buildings, and not likely to ease distribution, bored with the way their mouths twitched over their cigar ends. Said Jim X, there once was a poor, honest sailor a heavy drinker, a hell of a cuss, a rouster, a boozer, and the drink finally sent him to a hospital. And they operated. And there was a poor whore in the woman's ward had a kid while they were fixing the sailor. And they brought him the kid when he came to and said, here, it's what we took out of you. And he looked at it and he got better. And when he left the hospital, quit the drink. And when he was well enough, signed on with another ship and saved up his pay money and kept on saving his pay money and bought a share in the ship and finally had half shares, then a ship and in time a whole line of steamers and educated the kid. And when the kid was in college, the old sailor was again taken bad and the doctor said he was dying. And the boy came to the bedside and the old sailor said, boy, I'm sorry, I can't hang on a bit longer. You're young yet. I leave you responsibilities. I wish I could have waited till you were older, more fit to take over the business. But father, don't don't talk about me. I'm all right. It's you, father. That's it, boy. You said it. You called me your father, and I ain't. I ain't your dad, no. I am not your father, but your mother, quote he. Your father was a rich merchant in Stambouli.
Well, we can come back to the screen here. People probably find that less amusing now than they would have in Ezra Pound's day. Um, but I think the point of the cantos in a way is, you know, almost contrasting the ingenuity of Dos Santos, the Portuguese, who figured out what you could do with this corn that had been soaked in water and made a fortune out of it and was quite productive with it. Um, and, you know, really started a whole pork industry in Portugal, as opposed to these bankers who aren't interested in anything except more bank, bank buildings. Everything else is too uncertain for them. And they're the usurers in Excelsis. They make their 20% and all they care about is getting their money back and the contrast. And then Jim X, who's in there, tells them a story that um, I think in Pounds Day would have been viewed as um, non-productive love, let's say. You know, it's sort of a joke around it that the sailor believes that the boy was taken out of his belly. Um, but we know that Dante put usurers in the same circles of hell as he put sodomites. You know, Dante was using the um, old Catholic um, sort of cosmology with the circles of hell. And so there is a, you know, interesting place where that story fits in with what's going to be Pound's evolving sense of money and what makes fair practice with money and what's supportive of the arts and what's supportive of peace as opposed to, you know, the other side of things. Um, so we end up with, you know, that kind of slangy talk. I personally appreciate the description that Pound gives of the observation of these bankers and how bored he is with their cigars and the little rims around their vests and their talk about securities and the uncertainty of business and, you know, most of us have probably not been in board meetings, but I think we can imagine what board meetings at a bank are like. And um, anyhow, so that's where that canto ends. And now let's turn the page and go to what is one of the best known of the cantos and one of the most anthologized and really changes the terms of things. Kung is Kun Futsu, or we call him in the West, Confucius. Kung walked by the dynastic temple and into the cedar grove, and then out by the lower river, and with him Kyu, Chi, and Tian, the low speaking. And we are unknown, said Kung. You will take up charioteering, then you will become known. Or perhaps I should take up charioteering or archery or the practice of public speaking. And Tzu Lu said, I would put the defenses in order. And Q said, if I were Lord of a province, I would put it in better order than this is. And Chi said, I would prefer a small mountain temple with order in the observances, with a suitable performance of the ritual. And Tian said, with his hand on the strings of the lute, the low sounds continuing after his hand left the strings, and the sound went up like smoke under the leaves, and he looked after the sound. The old swimming hole, and the boys flopping off the planks or sitting in the underbrush playing mandolins. And Kung smiled upon all of them equally, and Tseng Zi desired to know which had answered correctly. And Kung said, they've all answered correctly. That is to say, each in his nature. And Kung raised his cane against Yuan Zhang, Yuan Zhang being his elder. For Yuan Zhang sat by the roadside pretending to be receiving wisdom. And Kung said, you old fool, come out of it. Get up and do something useful. And Kung said, respect a child's faculties from the moment it inhales the clear air. But a man of 50 who knows nothing 
is worthy of no respect. And when the princes gathered about him, all the savants and artists, his riches will be fully employed. And Kung said, and he wrote on the bow leaves, if a man have not order within him, he cannot spread order about him. And if a man have not order within him, his family will not act with due order. And if the prince have not order within him, he cannot put order in his dominions. And Kung gave the words order and brotherly deference and said nothing of the life after death. And he said, anyone can run to excesses. It is easy to shoot past the mark. It is hard to stand firm in the middle. And they said, if a man commit murder, should his father protect him and hide him? And Kung said, he should hide him. And Kung gave his daughter to Kong Chang, although Kong Chang was in prison. And he gave his niece to Nan Yang, although Nan Yang was out of office. And Kung said, Wang ruled with moderation. In his day, the state was well kept. And even I can remember a day when the historians left blanks in their writings. I mean, for things they didn't know. But that time seems to be passing. And Kung said, without character, you will be unable to play on that instrument or to execute the music fit for the oaks. The blossoms of the apricot blow from the east to the west. And I have tried to keep them from falling. Let's come back to the full screen, Paul. Petals on a wet black bow again. And the peach leaves going down the stream of Canto too. Yeah. And Amy, I think that's about as close as Pound will get to Dogan. But but I, I wanted to say something about that because um, when she mentioned that, I remembered reading uh, one of the Greek philosophers, and of course I couldn't remember which one it was, but had a, a theory, a philosophy really, really similar to that. <clears throat> and I looked it up and I don't know if this is the one I was thinking of, but apparently <clears throat> Aristotle uh, believes that uh, Anything that is eternal is necessary. If the present form of the world always was and always will be, it is necessary and no other form is possible. So the past, the present, all those forms of time all kind of coexist. But I, I still don't know if he was the one that I was reading or saw a reference to. Does anybody know Greek philosophy who can jump in here? Anyway, he, he knew Greek philosophy, right? Even if he didn't know Dogen. He knew some of it. Yeah, he knew some of it. You know, as a poet, I think he was more interested in poetry. And, um, you know, um, and he got, he really, he got his philosophy from Confucius. Confucius. Yeah, that's Kung. That's his philosophy right there. That canto, canto 13 is really, you know, that is, um, let's say, that would be Ezra Pound's ideal of what the spiritual practice spiritual practice is. You know, and I, I love the account of each of the disciples or the boys, you know, trying to figure out like what does he want us to answer and just saying what they really want. And he says, they're all right. They've asked, they've answered after their each after their own nature. And the sense of, you know, the inward orderliness and the um the middle way, really you know, the middle way, not going to excesses and how hard it is to stand firm in the middle. And Pound spent then much of his life translating Confucius, he, the ta Hyo, which he translated as the unwobbling pivot. That's the standing firm in the middle. Like, can you stand firm in the middle and not be, you know, drawn off by other people? And um, this this becomes really, you know, I think the core of, of the, um, I think you could say the ethical philosophy that Pound is looking for, for the cantos. So he's got many different things that he needs to put in, but this is, you know, the first real approach to the um, Asian material. Paul, you got a question there. Yeah, I'm going back to um, that line where he says, uh, 
And Kung said, without character, we will be unable to play on that instrument. And I'm thinking of the pound quote, more poets fail from lack of character than lack of talent. So I'm seeing that stream. And so as he's, as he's coming to this through his material, you know, that, that I forget exactly where that line was published, but it's one I've never forgotten. It's one that Sam loved to use over and over. More mm -hmm. poets fail from lack of character than lack of talent. Yeah, yeah, somewhere Pound says that, I'm sure, in his essays. And here you can see he's also linking it in a way to the troubadours because their poems were made to be sung to an instrument. And here he's now going into Confucian China and Confucius, he translated the Book of Odes or the Shit Jing, which is the, um, you know, it, it's said that Confucius collected 300 folk songs from around China. And the folk songs were considered one of the great books because it gave a view of what ordinary people thought about and sang about. And not surprising, there's a lot of love poems. There's a lot of poems about hard work. Um, I think Pound saw this as the same impulse as the troubadours who remember he'd gotten the, um, the song up out of Spain along with the viols or the viols or the, we call them violas now, you know, or lutes or something. So, you know, this connection of music to poetry. Yeah, that, and that again reminds me of Sandberg and his collection of the Great American Songbook. Yeah, mm -hmm. very yeah. much. Yeah. Thanks. So you can see um, what I'm trying to do now is show like a little, little bit. We have those four Malatesta cantos. They've provided a further sense of structure or maybe you could say method for pound. Um, you know, the method of bringing in many voices, many styles, many artists. And then we had um, a quick look at the difference between sort of, you know, innovative people who figure out things to do to make money that are actually sort of useful, as opposed to the people who just sit around planning how to build more bank buildings. And we're supposed to now be connecting that a little bit to the Medici's who are only for themselves or the previous cantos and um, versus Malatesta, who was trying to put money forward for the artists and pounds, not really friend, but he knew this guy, James Quinn, somewhat. Um, and then the change in tone, when we go from that story that Jim X tells to the bankers to sort of shock them out of their complacency because he's so bored with them. We move from that tone to Confucius, which gives us now a certain kind of um, backbone here. And I think we should now do one more canto because we're going to go to two cantos that are known as the hell cantos. You can't very well structure something on Dante without going through hell. And we haven't really been there yet. We'll probably come back to this. So I'm just going to read it rather than stopping to translate, but we're going to go down into hell now. Io veni in luogo d'ogni luce muto, the stench of wet coal, politicians E and N, their wrists bound to their ankles, standing bare bum, faces smeared on their rumps, wide eye on flat buttock, bush hanging for beard, addressing crowds through their arseholes, addressing the multitudes in the ooze, newts, water slugs, water maggots, and with them are a scrupulously clean table napkin tucked under his penis, and M, who disliked colloquial language, stiff starched, but soiled collars circumscribing his legs, the pimply and hairy skin pushing over the collar's edge, profiteers drinking blood sweetened with shit, and behind them F and the financiers lashing them with steel wires. And the betrayers of language, N and the press gang, and those who had lied for hire, the perverts, the perverters of language, 
the perverts who have set money lust before the pleasures of the senses, howling as of a hen yard in a printing house, the clatter of presses, the blowing of dry dust and stray paper, fetter, sweat, the stench of stale oranges, dung, last cesspool of the universe, mysterium, acid of sulfur, the pusillanimous raging, plunging jewels in mud and howling to find them unstained, sadic mothers driving their daughters to bed with decrepitude, sows eating their litters, and here the placard, I can't they, and here the personnel changes. This I think becomes one of Pound's mantras, no matter how bad the hell is, the only difference is that the personnel have changed. The same forces are at work. So we're down in hell and seeing the personnel changing, melting like dirty wax, decayed sandals, stick handles, the bums sinking lower, faces submerged under hands, and in the ooze under them, reversed foot palm to foot palm, hand palm to hand palm, the agent's provocateurs, the murderers of Person McDonough, Captain H, the chief torturer, the petrified turd that was various, bigots, Calvin and St. Clement of Alexandria, black beetles burrowing into the shed, the soil of decrepitude, the ooze full of morsels, lost contours, erosions, above the hell rot, the great arsehole, broken with piles, hanging stalactites greasy as sky over Westminster, the invisible many English, the place lacking in interest, last squalor, utter decrepitude, the vice crusaders farting through silk, waving the Christian symbols, frigging a tin penny whistle, flies carrying news, harpies dripping shit through the air, the slew of unamiable liars, bog of stupidities, malevolent stupidities, and stupidities, the soil living pus full of vermin, dead maggots begetting live maggots, slum owners, usurers squeezing crab lice, panders to authority, pets to loop sitting on piles of stone books, obscuring the texts with philology, hiding them under their persons the air without refuge of silence, the drift of lice teething, and above it, the mouthing of orators, the arse-belching of preachers, and NVIDIA, the corruptio, fetter, fungus, liquid animals, melted ossifications, slow rot, fetid combustion, chewed cigar butts, without dignity, without tragedy, M. Episcopus waving a condom full of black beetles, monopolists, obstructors of knowledge, obstructors of distribution. Let's come back to the full screen. Those of you who have not read this canto before, I hope it impressed you. certainly has been, uh, you know, it's an interesting one to go from the sort of calmness of the Kung Canto to this, you know, um, T.S. Eliot didn't like this canto. He kept saying, it doesn't feel like you really experienced this. This feels like description. You should show what it's like to be down there in hell. But I think, you know, Pound is being Dante and hanging out with his Virgil and going out and seeing these people. And he's starting to name names now. You know, he's starting to really do what Dante did, which is to take living people. Um, and that's why there are all those dot, 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 dots, is because when these cantos were published, his publishers, probably rightly, this includes James Laughlin, who founded New Direction, said, we can't publish this. You know what the lawsuits will do to New Directions? So, you know, it's sort of censored because uh, of the you know, possibilities of libel. But I think Pound was probably having a really good time with these hell cantos. 
There are enough new directions in the actual canto. Yes. But very importantly, um, you're starting to see obstructors of knowledge. You know, I think he saw, he's beginning to see these sort of um, collusion of people who obstruct the channels of knowledge, obstruct distribution, and who practice usury, you know, that um, these are the real evils. And so, you know, I just want to point out to you that we, we're not talking right, or he's not talking necessarily right here about war, but we've come a long way from Canto One, where the cause of all the bad stuff seems to be Aphrodite, who is also known as Argosidia, the slayer of Greeks, you know, and sort of blaming bad stuff on sex gone bad, he's now, I think, here taking a view, no, it's actually a collusion of money-making interests with the panders in the press who distribute wrong information and hide things for them. Did you tell us earlier that T.S. Eliot worked in a bank? T.S. Eliot did work in a bank. Did Pound they have tried conversations, to bail him out. conversations about that? <laughs> Pound tried to bail him out. He said, what a horrible fate for a great poet. And he set up a fund and they raised a bunch of money and Elliot calmly said, no, thanks. Right, I'm happy. Really said that. <laughs> and he didn't stay very long in the bank. He ended up at Faber okay. and Faber well, as a main thing. editor. And he spent the rest of his life working as an editor at yeah. Faber and um, wielding a lot of power, you know, wielding a lot of power. Yeah, there's a, a wonderful app um, that Faber created because they had all this stuff in the basement and there's a, a copy of the wasteland there with all of uh, Pound's edits scrawled all over it and stuff. Have you seen that? Uh, I've seen, yeah, they've, they've um, and his, assembly edition, yeah. His little remarks too, which were quite scathing. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah. they were good friends, and in it's those worth days, looking it, up. it's free. Yeah, and in those days, I think they really felt like they were working in the service of poetry. You know, poets often now tiptoe around and praise one another's work if they bother to read that. I think you know those guys were close, trusting friends, and you know, I think they trusted one another that they could say, "That's terrible." You know, don't do that. Uh, let's see, uh, Carla, you have a question. I haven't read Dante um, except excerpts here and there. And so I'm wondering how much of the description in that last canto that you read um, was is, is out of Dante, um, because it also reminds me of an ekphrasis of Hieronymus Bosch paintings. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, if you think Hieronymus Bosch and Dante near contemporaries, you know, certainly, you know, in terms of where we are and both, you know, very, very aware of, you know, the um, Christian cosmology, let's say. Um, but, uh, you know, Pound may have seen some Hieronymus Bosch, I think, you know, he may not have, but he'd got a lot out of Dante and Dante has, you know, these kinds of really horrific images, even more horrific, really. I mean, Pound is going more for kind of uh, like a kind of grotesquery. The horrors in Dante's Inferno are, are very real. And Pound also makes the point that you go down into Dante's Inferno and at some point, everything changes. The deeper you go, it's all about money. And so he was, you know, he really saw it himself as an heir to Dante, trying to blow the whistle on the, the you know, the money mad who are destroying the world. You know, Pound is beginning to more and more believe that, you know, the World War I that he saw destroy the Renaissance he was part of was not about like, um, you know, like bad sex among the Greeks or, you know, that, that it was a collusion of money makers, arms dealers and the press that sent, you know, us to war. And I think, you know, modern historians would probably agree with that. 
the World War I, certainly, you know, that was the, the collusion there. And Pound is finding Dante, you know, Dante's giving him a different kind of structure than the Tempio. The Tempio is like how you build things in a, you know, multiple way. Dante is giving him the structure of go through hell, go through purgatory, and go up into the Paradiso. And um, you know, there'll be a lot of quotes from Dante in here. Yeah, and you don't, you don't need to know Dante to read the cantos, but it's really useful background. You know, and like so the, does eventually like, does the Paradiso um, is that represented by his depiction of Confucianism? Uh, there are moments of paradise. That's a really complicated question of what he comes to think of as paradise. But he's quite clear that paradise is a state of mind. You know, it's not like a Billy Graham, 1500 acres up in the sky and you better get your real estate quick because they're running out of real estate up there. You know, to pound paradise is a state of, or, or it's, it's a permanent state of mind that it will become, you know, available, but he's not there yet. He's working his way towards that. Okay. Well, Matthew, Andrew, at the same, oh, yeah. sorry. No, I oh. didn't have Okay. I'm just going to say just very quickly at the same time when, when we were reading that whole Italian Renaissance section, all of those um, city state warlords who uh, were, you know, building alliances and betrayals and blah, 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 you know, fighting. And then there are those, uh, those poor idiots who are out in the cold, you know, the, the poor soldiers, I guess. I mean, that to me reminded me of World War One, because that's how World War One started too with the arch. Duke and all the alliances in Europe, and I wondered if if that if I'm just imagining that. I'm imagining. You're wondering if you're imagining what the, uh, the parallel, was. the parallel that it's kind of like an echo of what led to World War One with the different world warlords and city states. No. Um, yeah, and using the soldiers as pawns and basically for their own gain. That's it was out of that aristocracy that World War One started. Yeah, yeah. Andrew, can you say a little bit more about the Thirteenth Canto um, in relation to what Confucius or Kung says about um, if man have not order with him, him on page fifty nine. He can't spread order and it's kind of a beautiful you know counterpart to the 14th canto is there a reason you think that he put these two next to one another based on what you just said about Par paradiso being a state of mind i think there's absolutely a reason why he put them together um but i think just feeling the difference rather than trying to describe it you know i think feeling that transition um you know is really the important thing to do i think with a lot of the changes of mood as you go from one canto to another that's part of the structure here you know i think really importantly you know so this would be a little bit like somebody who has a hieronymus bosch painting hangs it on their wall and then brings in a great piece of calligraphy by hakuin or one of the zen masters and hangs it there and if you say why'd you do that you know more important is to feel what it is that made them do that mm. Yeah, Matthew. Yeah, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, and, and yeah. I mean, his love of the colloquial and his uh, in in you know he's uh, purifying the language of the tribe and his fear of uh, you know the um, the betrayers of language and he doesn't like attack academia but philologists which I guess is sort of like our modern version of but it's it's interesting because he's both uh, both down home and highly uh, uh, academic himself or not academic scholarly I'll say and. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, so I think, but I think he'd make a strong distinction between those two things, that his love of scholarship and and academic games, but yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, also because I think he has a fatal hubris too, and his hubris is that he can write a book that serves for civilization like Homer's did, and, and on top of that, maybe he can write a book that will prevent the next war. If he can point out what the origins of war are and who's profiteering from it, you know, 
he can usher in a different kind of paradise. And that's, you know, now we look at that and say it's total hubris. Um, and that's, you know, one of the tragedies, um, you know, because we know that in 20 years, less than 20 years from when he's writing these things, Europe is going to be ripping itself apart even worse than World War I, you know. And in fact, the world is going to be ripping itself apart. And um, yeah, so there's a there's, there's there's a real tragedy in this and there's madness. Um, and I, I read a great quote, you know, in, a, in an article where uh, this person said, uh, Edgar Pound is like a really good example of how genius is so close to crackpot. Yeah. Yeah. And I love that also even the term genius sounds so Latinate and crackpot is so colloquial American. You know. I, I, I think it's just his his wanting to be a man of action and, and this whole philosopher king or philo or artist king or artist power thing. It's, I mean, how many Wall Street guys do you see that really know art? You know, it just it doesn't happen for a reason. Yeah. You know, they're, and that's part library. of the role. That's a part of the role. The Kung Canto there, the Confucius, which is when the prince has gathered the artists and savants around him. You know, so yeah. you know, in a sense, so, yeah. that's what Pound is saying. You know, you shouldn't have politicians who reward their money-making friends with cabinet positions. You know, mm -hmm. a leader should bring the artists and the savants, the philosophers, the artists, the you know in there, not the, not the, you know, technocrats and money makers and campaign donors and whoever else. Andrew, how about a preview of next week? What uh, should folks focus on if they want to do a little research beforehand? Um, well, let's see. I would say if you want to read the next canto, we probably don't need to read it together because it is more um, of this kind of hell language, but feel in particular where you come out of it because you come out of it and Canto 16 then begins at hell's mouth and we're about to go up the mountain of purgatory and purgatory is going to include a long passage on world war one in french and if you don't read french that's okay um i'll just point out a couple lines that are key to it and then also um, a little anecdote about the um, Russian Revolution and the Bolsheviks. Um, you know, because Pound is well aware of these two things, World War I and the Bolshevik Revolution, and that we're, this is the, you know, this is the purgatory that the world is in while he's there. Um, and, uh, you know, so I would read the next two cantos and we can talk about those. And then to go back to the question that came up earlier about paradise, if you want to read Canto 17, this may be the most beautiful or one of the three most beautiful cantos in the book, and it is paradise. No, so Canto 17, but it's only paradise for a moment until we have to drop down into something else. But I think Pound is going to give paradise not as a place or not the end of a journey, but something that's there all the time to be accessed. Um, and it's going to be, you know, you'll see a cast of characters that are familiar and a landscape that is familiar, but... Um, uh, and particularly the last line of Canto 17 is one of the um, beautiful images lines, sunset, like the grasshopper flying. Think of that as a haiku, sunset, like the grasshopper flying. Thank you, Andrew. Good, I'll see everybody next week then. Take Fantastic. care, be safe, everybody. What a great session. Thank you all for, for being part of this. Uh, without you, it doesn't happen. I'll end with uh, the graphic there so we can have something for the record. Did I share Did I share that? Here, share screen and go there like that. That's okay. something. That's something. Thank, Thank you, Paul. Andrew. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, and I'll give you a call later in the week probably, Paul.